Hey, everybody, Dave Hagen here. What do budgets and diet soda have in common? We'll discuss that today on the Financial Wellness Podcast. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to the financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Financial Wellness Podcast, or the TFWP, as we like to call it. You're listening to episode 441, which means the 41st episode in season four. Or hard to believe, hard to believe. With me today, we've got Mr. Brian Reed. Brian, how are you? Howdy, David. Haven't seen you in a while. Things are good? Things are good. It's good to be back uh, with you and uh, doing another uh, podcast here. And as Get Mar- Get Smart used to say, and loving it. <laughs> and loving it. Also Absolutely. with us, we got Nick with us today. I think he's uh, out there on the freeway. Nick, you out there somewhere? Oh, Dave, Dave, can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> what are you on the 405 or something? What's up with that? I, I don't know where I am, Dave. I'm, I'm coming to LA. <laughs> Nick's, Nick's a little confused uh, uh, lately. You know, um, I've got a riddle for y'all. What, what, do, what does Nick and Kim Kardashian have in common have they been romantically linked are you talking about my derriere like that (laughs) you know recently she was uh linked with uh oh what's the guy's name from snl it like everybody's all uh all worked up on the internet about who you know i'm talking about the guy with the blonde hair pete davidson that's who it is pete davidson goodness gracious she's barely gotten uh, over Kanye and she's uh, flipped over to Pete Davidson, but it gives stuff, uh, it gives people stuff to talk about. But no, Nick and Kim have not been romantically linked. Do either of you want to guess how what Nick and, and Kim have in common? I still think it's my uh, great derriere. Uh, I'm thinking not. <laughs> Any, anyone else? I, if you don't, if you don't guess, I'll tell you both. Nick and Kim passed a bar exam recently. How about that? Congratulations to Nick. Woo-hoo! He passed the bar exam. Well done, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Except I would say that my bar exam was just a tad bit harder. Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Cause yeah, Nick passed the full bar. Um, you know, Kim passed the, the baby bar. And a, a lot of people have asked, what's the baby bar? Well, if, if in California, if you go to a law school, it doesn't have the, the full fancy uh, accreditation. Or if, you, or if you're still self-studying, you, after the first year, you've got to take like a, a, a mini exam. So this year, 275 people uh, took the baby bar and the pass rate was 20.7%. So, ooh, less than, uh, well, about one in five, about one in five passed that exam. So um, you know, she, I, I've never been a big fan necessarily of Kim Kardashian, but we should give credit where credit's due. And, you know, she passed the exam. Now it was her fourth try. So we need to be fair about that. And she announced it over Twitter, Instagram, or one of those things, wearing a um, skin tight blue satin kind of cat suit or something. I'm assuming you didn't announce <laughs> your, your results in similar attire, right, Nick? Dave, yeah, actually, no, I, I, I was not, and uh, I, I was not in my blue satin, uh, skin tight dress. Rather, I was crying my eyes out, calling my family, and they asked me, "Did you fail or did you pass?" <laughs> and I told them I passed. <laughs> Either way, it's hugely emotional. I remember, you know, back in the day, back in the day. And you remember Kim Kardashian, her her father, Robert Kardashian, um, you know, he was on the OJ dream team, defense team and all that kind of stuff. Um, So I guess they have a history of that. And she wants to pursue, uh, you know, criminal justice issues, people that were 
um, wrongly incarcerated or wrongly accused. So, I mean, good for her. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily the fact that she passed, not necessarily, you know, any, any reflection on her, her intellectual ability, although she makes a lot of money. So she, she's got to have some intellectual ability, but really it's, it's um, with all the other things that she does and with all the other things going on in her life, she was actually able to set aside some time and, and pass the exam. I know Nick, when, when you were looking to pass the full bar, I mean, you pretty much disappeared. You, you ceased to exist on the planet because you were holed up in a library or holed up in your apartment down there um, trying to get ready to pass. So, Oh, oh, definitely. But I, I will say one thing, you know, I, I'm not big for reality TV, but you know, even passing the baby bar, it's no small feat. It's still a very difficult test. And, uh, you know, as you said, give credit where credit's due. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And getting back to you, Nick, wow, you passed, you passed the little quiz, three day quiz, two and a half day quiz, whatever it is these days. Congratulations. I, I really appreciate it, Dave. Thank you so much. I will still always remember you mean, Nick, why are you going to law school? <laughs> so true. So true. We could talk about that in, in future, uh, in fed, future podcasts, but um, you know, you, you put out a lot of money, incurred a lot of debt. You spent a lot of time, you moved to another town. Um, and, you know, to pass that quiz is, is no uh, easy feat. I know that a, a lot of people, can't pass it. Do you, do you know what the bar passage rate was for your, your test? I do. So overall it was around uh, 50% for all bar takers. Wow. So, so 10 weeks, three years of, of law school, uh, 10 weeks of, of studying all the money and time that goes into that. And, and the rates about half. Those are brutal yeah. numbers. Can you imagine that? Like, could you imagine spending one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars and only having a fifty percent chance to become a lawyer? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty risky stuff. I heard someone talking recently, uh, and they were saying, you know, your 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 education is part of your portfolio, but um, you know, you're going to spend an enormously large amount of money and time just on you know, this little educational piece. So you should be, you know, reasonably sure about it. So are you, you sure you want to be a lawyer? I mean, there's, I guess there's no going back now. I don't know. I, I mean, the interest I had is not the interest I'm about to be paying. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, congratulations to Nick and now uh, go get a job, dude. Uh, today's topic, today's topic is going to be what do budgets and diet soda have in common. And so here we are at the uh, here we are at the end of the year and I've been giving this some thought and I came across an article on um, CNN business. And then the title of the article was Diet Soda is disappearing from store shelves uh, by Danielle Weiner Bronner. And you know I, I I like a good diet soda maybe more than than the average guy. Diet soda is is kind of my my drink of choice although I try not to drink too much. Uh, so I'm I'm reading along and it turns out that, like in 2020, the U.S. retail carbonated soft drink market was about 40 billion bucks. So there's about 40 billion bucks just in soft drinks or sodas uh, being bought out there every year. And this is according to a market research company, Mintel. And out of this 40 billion dollars being spent, the sugar-free portion or the diet portion is about 11 billion. So that's about like 25 percent. So one in four sodas is is sugar-free or diet. But it turns out also that the diet market's growing twice as fast as the, the sugary market. I, I guess my choice was always being, am I gonna, you know, am I gonna drink sugar-free and, and get cancer one day or drink sugar, the sugar drinks and um, absorb all those calories and and uh, you know get get some kind of diabetes. So that's that's the choice we're gonna have unless you're drinking filtered water all the time, right, Brian? So yeah, we don't want that. No, we don't want that. So it turns out that the research has shown that the millennials and Gen X, uh, especially those two groups, which are very important demographic demographics, don't like the connotation of diet because it implies like going without. Originally, the, the term diet was used so that um, sugar free wouldn't be necessarily, um, you know, uh, um, sold to women because people back then think that the only people that were on diets were women. Um, so they, they were, they kind of 
came up with this diet drink and 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 diet was determined i forget when when the the diet sodas came out back in uh, i don't know the 60s 70s something like that um but now now they're using the term zero and coke has been using zero since about 2005 and the research has so, shown that the, the millennials and the Gen Xers respond to zero better because it's like clear and, and doesn't have a lot of attachments and certainly doesn't have the, the diet connotation. And that was the point of the article was that the, the, this 25% or so of the, of the diet soda market was migrating to the term zero and getting away from the term diet because the millennials and Gen Xers didn't like it because uh, diet, the, the connotation is it's like doing without, it's like doing with less. It's like a restrictive kind of a thing. And diet's disappearing and zero, it's expanding. And, and you know me, I'm thinking about this and I'm going, oh, <laughs> I think this relates to the TFWP because on the TFWP, we've said so many times, we don't like diets. We don't like budgets. It's, as soon as you're on a, a, a budget, as soon as you're on a diet, you're, you don't want to be on it anymore. We, li we like spending plans, right, Brian? We're, we exactly. We like, we like zero stuff. It's cleaner. It's clearer. It's easier to understand. And, and, and really, it, it kind of comes from a place of abundance, you know, not, not want. You know, how many times have I said, budget's like a diet. As soon as you're on one, you're hungry, you want to eat or spend. So I think it's, it's all about the approach and it's all how you think about it. And, you know, this, this relates to financial wellness. And it also fits into our theme this year. You remember 12 months ago, I was saying that the theme this year was going to be that financial success is less about the head and more about the heart. Um, it's not about knowing all this stuff. You can, you can read and learn about financial wellness, um, but it, it's got to be, it's got to get to your heart. And unless you've really internalized it um, and you come to get really excited about it, it's, it's really hard to, to make it happen. You know, recently I was, I was talking with a, um, a group of, of financial planners um, and we were talking about this and I don't know that they'd ever really thought this through, but I said, gee, isn't more about what you do more about the heart than the head. And they, and they said, well, but you got to know, you got to have all this training. You got to have these licenses. I said, yeah, I get that. And that's all true. And that that's kind of like a baseline to what you do, but to really get someone to come along with you on that financial wellness journey it's really got to be internalized. It's really got to get to their heart. And they said, yeah, you know what? I never thought of it in those terms, but that's exactly right. So, so maybe those people will think about that a little bit more and, and they can get more of their, their clients to, you know, to really, to really get on board. You ever thought about that before, Brian, more about the heart than the, than the head? I think it's like anything when you're, I hate to say, use the word invested in something. Um, you know, you care about it more. It's part of your day in, day out life. Um, yeah. It's not just something that you're, you're just keeping on the outside and, uh, um, you know, occasionally thinking about it. it just becomes part of you. And I think that's what you're talking about when you say less about the head and more about the heart is that, you know, your financial wellness just becomes part of you. It's something you do. It's something you care about. Um, you don't, you're not afraid of it. Um, you understand that, you, you know, if you have a, a plan, then you can have some fun with some investments that are a little riskier, but let's have your, uh, your solid base. Um, and it's something that is just part of you. It's right. no longer something external. Right. Right. And I think that when it's part of you, you come to the realization that, you know, Hey, I've had some success and you're, and you're looking at something that you want to acquire and you you, you think in your head, hmm, I could certainly just go out and buy that, but maybe I choose not to because it's not within the, you know, it's not within my guidelines. It's not with where I want to be long term. And you've really got to have that uh, hanging on your, your heart and have that accessible. It's like when I say, hey, if you walk into an elevator and someone goes, hey, what's your, what's your financial wellness plan? You should be able to two or three sentences lay that out for somebody. And if you can't, well, it's, it's, it's not close enough to your heart, it seems to me. But 
if you have a financial plan that's not in your heart, well, maybe you need to think about ways that you can do that. Or maybe, or maybe, uh, maybe you need a different financial plan that you can really get behind, you know? Yeah. Maybe that's, if you're not into your plan and you have one, then adjust your plan. Right. You're not, you're not focused on it. Right. Exactly. I mean, I can't think of how many times I've said, okay, I'm going to eat cleaner and better this week. Da, 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 and I'm driving to work. And then I go, oh, oh there's a McDonald's. <laughs> Like, should I drive in there? <laughs> it's tempting. It's tempting. So the other thought that I had is, you know, we're at the end of the year. This episode's going to drop then. And it's time to start thinking about, you know, goals for next year. And yeah, we're, we're still before Christmas, but I think that it's time to start evaluating this year and, and, and start looking um, or thinking about next. And, you know, we don't want to rehash it and spend a lot of time um, talking about, um, you know, goals and resolutions and, and stuff like that, because we talked about it uh, last year in episodes 301 and, and 302, and we have some really good stuff there. So if you, if you don't remember what we talked to, you know, we, we go back and take a listen. We talked about, you know, how accessible goals should be, how they should be stated, how, how you want to phrase those. Um, really good stuff in, in those episodes. But the point that I want to make today is that um, you might want to start thinking about it and you might want to start thinking about the goals that you have next year and coming at it from a place, not a place of diet, but from a place or thought process uh, of zero, you know, of, of zero soda. And, you know, that is focusing on the result and in, and in, internalizing it. And, you know, a good way to state a goal as you're thinking about this for next year is, hey, I'm not going to restrict my eating out to 200 a month, because uh, that's going to be tough to follow. But but a good goal might want to be something like, wow, I want to increase my savings by 200 a month, which will result in a really astronomical uh, large amount of money um, down the road. It's much easier to get behind that and follow it. And yeah, we got some time before the end of the year. What is it about 10 days, I guess, to Christmas or so, Brian, but yeah. uh, it's, it's time to start evaluating this year, going through that process. You can't do this in a day. You can't do this in a short walk. It's time to start mulling it around in your brain and thinking about it a little bit. So next week and the week after, especially after the first of the year, when we start talking about, you know, the next year's financial plan, et cetera, et cetera, you've already had some time to kind of remunerate ruminate, I guess, is the word on it and think about it and, and you'll be uh, ready to go. Any thoughts about that, Brian? It's always a good thing to do. Do a little checklist at the end of the year, see how you did and start planning for the future. Yeah. Got to have a plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that uh, Nick dropped off here after we gave him all those uh, uh, accolades for, for passing the bar, but he, he was hitting a space where he didn't have good reception. So Nick is gone and Brian's still with me. We're going to do an email. Hold on. We'll be right back. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications. Let's listen in now as Dave answers some emails. All right. So Brian's still hanging with us. What you got, Brian? Uh, we've got an email here from Steve who wrote it and said, Dear Dave, uh, real estate prices seem to be at an all-time high all over the country. Uh, should I buy now or wait uh, for things to become more fo- more affordable? Any thoughts? Yeah, that's what he said. Thanks, it was Steve. S- Steve, right? Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Here, I mean, here here's a couple thoughts. Um, one, I I don't I don't know where housing prices are going to go. I mean, they always seem to surprise me where they've gone up over the years. Um, although I've also seen them gone down a couple times in the last 20 years in, in a big way. Um, I remember when we were advising people 20 years ago, we would say, well, invest in California real estate. No one's ever lost a dime in California real estate. And I've seen people get wiped out in two waves 
um, over the years. So I really don't know where prices are going to go, but boy, they, you know, they still seem to be going up. And I, and as an aside, I don't know how someone can even afford to get into real estate right now. It's so darn expensive. I see people who think, well, I might have to put 30, 40, 50, maybe 60% of my, my uh, income towards uh, my housing just to get into a house. And um, I don't know, that's tough. That's tough. On the other hand, I remember a, a walk I had years ago with my uncle, uh, who was a wise guy and had done uh, very well in investing and in, in real estate. And I said, you know, uh, what piece of advice would you give me? And he says, look, you know, make the best call that you can put your head down and work hard for a bunch of years and then poke your head up only then after a bunch of years and see where you're at. If you made a good call, you'll probably be in a good spot. The mortgage won't seem like a big number compared to what you're making or what the property's worth. But that was just his way of uh, doing it. But wow, it seems it seems now that, that when people are getting in, and I remember back when we bought our first piece of property, it seems like you, you know, you walk in the house and, and the only thing you got to, to put in that one house is like one pair of undies or something, you know? I mean, it's, it's pretty thin, pretty tough to, to get into some real estate. But my thought today is really not so much that in response to, to Steve's email, but more of a thought of something to, else to think about. It's not if, but maybe more of where. Um, think about where would be the appropriate place to get into some real estate in the country. Um, there's a lot of really good places, and I think there's a lot of places that, that have a lot of uh, opportunity. I recently had a niece um, that moved out of state uh, with their boyfriend because there was, there was more opportunity in another state. LA is a pretty tough market. LA is pretty expensive. LA, New York, probably San Francisco, maybe Seattle now, um, you know, really expensive. So there's other places that have, um, you know, opportunity. Where was it that our, our man Elon moved to recently? Um, I think it was Austin, Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they even moved the headquarters of, uh, of Tesla, the business headquarters of Tesla to, to Austin, I believe. So it, it's interesting how things have evolved over time. You know, I remember back when I, uh, back in the day when I was coming up, Orange County was the cheap place to go get land and live. And now Orange County is like, oh my goodness, it's almost expensive. In some cases, maybe more, even more expensive than, than Los Angeles. Then there were other outlying areas. Um, you know, Ventura County was, was cheaper and then got expensive. And, um, you know, you know the, there's, you know, uh, lots of other areas around the central coast of California used to be dirt cheap and now it's more expensive. I remember in the eighties, um, all sorts of people were moving from LA up to Seattle because the, the economy was hot and the land was cheap. Not anymore, not anymore. Seattle's probably as expensive, maybe more expensive, uh, than, than even Los Angeles. So, uh, my thought would be, you know, don't necessarily get into real estate where you just happen to be sitting. Look around for opportunities. Look around for opportunities for appreciation, economic growth, the tax rate, infrastructure, um, you know, the people. Try and look into the future a little bit if you're going to really make a big investment um, in real estate. And then, you know, going back to the initial question, are prices up or down? Is this the time to get in? You're going to have to make that decision yourself because I really don't have a, a crystal ball on that. But I know that if you're going to be in a community for any period of time, or if you believe that you're going to be in a community for any period of time, maybe uh, seven to 10 years or more, real estate's maybe something that you're going to want to look at. If you're, if you're moving around, if you're not enamored with someplace yet, well, then I don't know, maybe you rent for a while. Maybe you push that part of your financial plan a little bit back. But that's, that's my thinking on the topic, Steve. All right, I think that's a wrap for today. Uh, Nick's already dropped off the line. He's out on the uh, freeways somewhere in, in uh, Southern California. Brian's still here. Brian, thanks for coming in. It, good to be back in the uh, studio with you. It's been a little bit, so good to hang with the boys. Good to have you here. All right, everybody, I think that's uh, a wrap of the show, and I think that's a wrap of the year. We're closing out 2021 here our fourth full season on the TFWP. We'll see you in 2022. We got some great stuff that we're working on. So come on back and we'll all work together for our own personal financial success. This is Dave Hagan. 
and you've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Remember, Dave will randomly draw from the submitted questions and pick the winner of a free one-hour personal conversation with Dave to help you achieve your financial goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications or share the podcast via the app with your family and friends. This is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.